I gave this talk at a symposium entitled Changing Sex, Changing Sexuality, Reimagining the Mutability of Sex, Gender, and Sexual Orientation in Science and Law. This symposium was sponsored by the Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. There were a lot of great talks at this symposium and they are still available at this URL that I've put on this slide. The title of my talk was From Babies to Gender Identity. I also wanted to say that there were great questions from the audience at the end and I have cut this out of the initial presentation and I will put it up as a separate uh, video at some point soon. So friends, it is truly an honor to be able to introduce to you Dr. Ann Fausto Sterling. Dr. Fausto Sterling is the Nancy Duke Lewis Professor of Biology and Gender Studies in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology and Biochemistry at Brown University. Her scholarship is currently focused on applying dynamic systems theory to the study of human development. Her ambitious goal is to fundamentally restructure discourses that are based on dichotomies inside the academy in public discourse and ultimately in the framing of social policy to bring about an understanding that nature and nurture are inseparable. Her cutting edge research is currently aimed at examining the emergence of gender differences in early childhood. She's the author of three widely acclaimed books, including her latest book, Sex, Gender, Biology in a Social World, which I personally highly recommend as one of the most accessible discussions of the science of human sexuality that I have ever encountered. She has taught at Brown University for over 40 years and has been a visiting professor at numerous institutions in the United States and abroad. Dr. Fausto Sterling is currently a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. With no further ado, I give you Ann Fausto Sterling. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank um, Lisa and Cliff and Terry and also Miriam Lovin for uh, facilitating my travel here and for enticing me to come to what is indeed a fascinating conference. Um, and uh, I guess I'm going to try to provide a, a new or different framework. Uh, it's not new to those of you who follow Lisa's work, but I'm going to try to make it quite explicit in order to help start us on a new language that can break us out of thinking in terms of oppositional nature and nurture. So in the title was, well, you saw the title, but <laughs> what, what I, <laughs> so the question is, how do we get from here a, a group of, of kind of nondescript newborns, we wouldn't know if they were boys or girls. Our only way to suspect it is by what kind of hat somebody's put on them. Um, to here, now these are, these are still small children, but here we are, likely, we are likely to want to be able to venture a guess as to which is the boy and which is the girl. Again, using clues, we could be wrong, but they are um, they're clues of, of clothing and haircuts and uh, that, kind of, that kind of thing. But by, by the time we start here and by the time we have toddlers, three-year-olds, we do have children who have, um, have at least a, a basic gender identity and definitely a gender expression. And so the question I've been trying to understand or reframe is how do we get from, um, from a kind of nondescript newborn to a three-year-old who has an opinion about what he or she is in terms of being a boy or girl and an opinion about what that means in terms of what they should play with, what kind of clothes they should wear, who their friends should be. 
Um, and so, and I don't want to leave out, although I'm not going to talk explicitly about this, uh, but of course we, we have, um, in, this, in this mix, we have children who, um, whose natal sex and whose gender identity do not match. Oops, wait, come back, I did this wrong, come back. If someone asked me why I used to be a boy and now I'm a girl, I would say that I have a girl brain and boy body, and I think like a girl, but I, but I just have a boy body, and it's different than you. It's different than you. So we can talk about that particular narrative to use to use your point um, later if if we want to. But I want you to, even though I'm not explicitly talking about. Um, transgender children, uh, I think we need to keep that in the mix because one of my goals is to provide um, an account of development that will explain not just the, the, the thing that we think is off, that is transgender, um, but will explain gender, that is f all of us. So a couple of things that we need to understand, forgive me if this is old hat to some of you, um, but it, I think it's worth emphasizing that we need to understand the distinction between sexual dimorphism and sex difference. And I'll explain what I mean by that distinction and how I'm using it. Um, and secondly, we need to understand that individual human development is a process and not a static thing. And I think uh, Lisa's, uh, Lisa's data make that quite clear in an older population. So first, sex difference. Uh, boys like trucks, girls like dolls, that's a, that's a generalization we tend to make. Um, but sometimes girls like trucks and boys like dolls. So these are differences in that they are, um, that we tend to generalize, but when we make a statement that says boys like trucks and girls like dolls, that's a sex difference that implies um, underneath it, we have to remember that we're always talking about overlapping populations and not, um, and not a, that all girls like trucks or dolls and all boys like trucks, um, but rather that there's a, a complex mixture of the two and also those are not mutually exclusive categories. In other words, you can like a truck and a doll. But sex, um, sex dimorphism tends to be uh, more mutually um, exclusive, and I usually demonstrate it with, uh, with this cartoon, um, which dates way back, but, uh, <laughs> but I, and what I like to say is that as they're looking into their panties, they're observing their dimorphisms. So these, uh, these and as you know, I've written about this, so the, even these are not absolutely different, but they are, um, they do, uh, the difference between male and female genitals accounts for it, a, a large percentage of the population, possibly 98 or 99 percent of the population, um, are non-overlapping in that regard. So, uh, so we need to keep that distinction in mind, and it's very easy for us to have slippage when we start using uh, generalizations about difference to thinking we're talking about dimorphism when we're really talking about um, enormously overlapping and varying uh, populations. So the, uh, I want to start with what I think of as the old ways of thinking about this. Um, as separate buckets where we have nature and nurture added together. <laughs> nature is usually seen as starting the ball rolling. Nurture layers some stuff on top. And this, I need to credit this cartoon from a book by Evelyn Fox Keller, The Mirage of a Space Between Nature and Nurture. And in this first um, cartoon, she says, uh, here is a bucket, Billy fills it with 40 liters of water, then Susie fills it with 60 liters of water, so 40% of the water in the bucket is due to Billy and 60% um, to Susie. So that's the bucket model, and I'm arguing that this is not the right model. Um, there's a, a, a twist on the bucket model, which I still think is an old way of thinking about it, um, which is uh, also some people call gene-environment interactions. Uh, but and often, 
that the frequently used metaphor is that of baking a cake. You put in ingredients. The ingredients are nature and nurture. You bake. And then something new emerges that's, um, that's different from just the flour and sugar, et cetera. Uh, and this is represented in this cartoon, also from Keller's book, where it says, suppose instead what happened was that Susie brought a hose to the bucket, then Billy turned the tap on. Now, how much of the water is due to Billy and how much to Susie? Um, and the answer is that the question no longer makes sense. Uh, so, uh, so if that's what's going on, then, um, then we, and the, and the question doesn't make sense, then what would be a sensible way to think about it? Um, what's missing from this model, just to uh, drive home the point, is uh, something that I call, and others, iterative development. And I essentially will spend the rest of the talk talking about iterative development, and hopefully you'll have a sense of what that means by the end of the, uh, uh, of the talk. So let's instead use dynamic systems to think about sex and development, sex and gender, and to think about development as a process, not something that starts at point X and then ends at point Y, where you have then a fixed trait at the end. Uh, I'm going to start very abstractly and theoretically, and then try to pull us into some much more specific examples about um, gender in early childhood. So the general idea that, um, that uh, developmental uh, theorists use in this in it here is that they start with the concept of a developmental landscape, which is this corrugated thing here. Um, and the idea you can think of the landscape as experience or environment, and it's something that changes with time, and you have a time axis. So if just for the sake of argument, um, you have time starting at birth, but really it starts at fertilization, um, uh, then you have, you have um, a ball representing an individual, and it will roll down. See, I learned how to do it, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> um, it will roll down one or another of uh, these uh, troughs and into a, into a deep valley that's called an attractor. And it's called an attractor really because it's kind of hard for the ball to get out of there, which means it can get out of there, but it, it takes a lot of energy to get it up and over a side and here to another side. Um, or it might go into a second attractor. And then you have these unstable places, which are the hills, which are called repellers. Um, and the ball doesn't stay there long, but it will roll off into it. So that's the general idea. Uh, now, if you, um, oh, OK. I, I added in a little movie. This is a movie actually about how cells become different starting from uh, starting at fertilization, so the egg begins to divide and new cells, which are practically identical, um, are produced. Um, and then they, as they roll downhill, uh, they begin to create their own landscape. So notice that the landscape um, is appearing and it has different colors and it, there's bifurcations and at each point, um, and at each point something new happens. So here we go. So think of these as babies instead of cells. Although I'm working on someone to make my own videos. So this, but see how the landscape is developing in this image. And each time there's a bifurcation, there's also a color change. The cells are differentiating. And at the very end, um, they become different cell types. It's the same process. It's the same idea in which you have now you're looking at a landscape that's been formed um, from whatever the material was in the, in, the, uh, initial, um, in the initial set of cell divisions. And then as the cells move, they also start to make impressions in the landscape. So there's this feedback back and forth. The landscape is not passive. The, um, the thing rolling down it is not passive. <coughs> 
If we translate this to think about just gender variation, and I don't mean anything specific when I use GV1 through GV4, I'm, it's gender variant 1 through 4, but I'm not talking about sex or sexuality, I'm just talking about anything you might want to attribute gender. It could be uh, variations in gender expression, um, anything for now. This is still a fairly abstract representation, but you figure that at birth you may have individuals who have some kinds of uh, physiological variation and they're also born into different experience, experiences and, um, and landscapes and as they, um, as, the, as gender, as this individuals begin to roll down this landscape um, they get pushed in one of, um, they, or they, or even accidentally end up in one of these troughs and they begin to separate out and at the bottom you end up with individuals who are in um, different attractor states which I'm just calling gender variant one through gender variant four. Uh, so, and this, and this changes with age. So again, still very abstract. So, let me start by saying, well, what do we know about sex differences at birth? What could some of these physiological variations be? And we know a little. Um, and it may or may not have anything to do with later sexual differentiation, what we do know. But we do know a little bit. So neonatal traits, these data come from a huge data set, an lo ongoing longitudinal study that a colleague of mine at Brown has been doing, and he gave me some of the data to play with. Um, first, we know that if in a data set of 50,000, if you do measurements, um, there are tiny sex differences in head circumference with boys having slightly larger heads. If you, um, if you knock the sample size down to 150, it's no longer significant. I mean, we're really talking small differences here. But they're there and they show up in huge sample sizes. Uh, same for, um, for weight at birth. Boys are slightly heavier than girls um, in Western well-fed societies. Mm -hmm. Um, not true in other in 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 any place where nutrition during pregnancy is an issue, uh, but uh, but again, it's the same thing. It, it's a it's a it's a reliable, repeatable difference on huge data sets. If the data set is huge, if it's a small data set, may or may not be significant. So it's a very tiny amount. Um, and then we have something called the APGAR score, where an APGAR score. Uh, how many people know what an APGAR <coughs> test is? Most, all right, most of you do, but some of you don't. It's a, it's a quick test of infant health done right at birth, and, um, and quickly the signs that are looked at are heart rate, respiratory, muscle tone, reflex color, um, and, uh, and a perfect score is 10. That is the most you can get is two for each of them. Um, and so uh, somebody with an APGAR of 10 is a very healthy baby. Someone with an APGAR of, of, um, of five or less is kind of dicey. Uh, someone with an APGAR of two is in, take them to the ICU. Uh, so, uh, so it's a, just a very quick test of health. And here, um, and here girls are slightly healthier at birth than boys. Uh, and we, uh, I've been experimenting with different ways of representing these traits, not one at a time, but in this case, three at a time. Um, and you can represent them as what, uh, as weight, head circumference, and APGAR at one minute for boys, for girls, and then you can subtract this graph from this graph, and what goes below the plane is what's larger for girls, what's above the plane is larger for boys. So this, these are, are multiple relative differences. There are other ways of looking at this, which may even be more useful, and that's to represent this on, um, and I, I didn't realize lawyers were supposed to be graph challenged, but, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll take you through this. Uh, this is the same data shown in a 3D uh, representation where the dots are, are uh, individual points and, um, and, the, uh, and the grid or the, um, the surface is what 
is the area that's, that's covered by the distribution of these points. And you can read um, individual, individual points here. For example, um, it, this, this individual right here has a head circumference of 33 uh, and a half centimeters, a, um, um, a uh, oh, we're talking kilograms, a weight of um, a weight of 4.4 kilograms and an APGAR of 5.5. Um, someone over here has an APGAR of 10, um, a weight of 3.7 kilograms and a head circumference of, um, of 36 centimeters. So you can get a sense of sort of individuals who are down in this area of the graph, in this area of the graph, and this is what boys look like and girls look like, uh, that this, that big distribution, and you can also layer um, one scatter plot on top of one, a different surface so that you can um, see, for example, the, in here, the dots are the, are the males, the boys, and um, the surface is the girls. And you can begin to see, and this is clearly a sex difference and not a dimorphism, you begin to see these small um, areas where there isn't overlap, but you also begin to see some other interesting clusters. Uh, so for example, you have a group here who is kind of intermediate in all of these traits. You have a group here who, um, who is, is pretty high in all of these traits. And you have a group here who's, uh, who's lower in a lot of these traits. And so one question to ask is whether, what's, whether there might be implications for very early um, uh, parent or caregiver uh, infant interaction, depending on whether you happen to fall into these groups, one of these groups, that is, does the size and physical health of the infant make a difference in how, um, and how a parent bonds with the infant in that very first, say, month of development? Um, and then, do we have a different distribution of boys and girls in those different categories? Uh, and you can do something called a cluster analysis to look at that. Um, so we can look at, if we look at clusters, the differences are strengthened in the following way. Um, you just, if you look at, um, uh, these are just arbitrary clusters that a statistics program pops out for you. Um, and, there's, and there are three clusters that are pretty identifiable. One of them, has uh, a large, um, the largest heads, largest uh, APGAR, and uh, I'm sorry, largest birth weight, largest APGAR, and largest um, uh, and largest head circumference, and uh, and then and one is kind of intermediate for all of them, and one is is somewhere in between. One is low for all of them, and one is kind of in between. And now, if you ask how many boys or girls belong to those clusters, you begin to see a kind of strengthening of the difference. So, what, and it's, it's kind of striking. You have, um, if, you, if you look at males and females, you find that there are um, something like 60% more males in cluster one. There are 40% um, more females in cluster two. And there are about equal numbers in cluster, oops, in cluster <coughs> three. <coughs> Stop working. No. There it goes. In cluster three. So if these categories or if these characteristics at birth are the relevant physiological categories that we're talking about, um, perhaps they have implications for early care, which then begins to set up um, set up certain kinds of interactions which later become what we call gen. Uh, totally hypothetical, but it's studyable. And, this, and, by, and by setting up your data this way, you could begin to do these studies. Um, and, and no one has studied it from this point of view. So if there are any young psychologists in the room, this is your lifetime, because I'm done. I'm just about done. <laughs> so this is what you have to do. Uh, so. What, you know, so how do individual infant differences alter the landscape um, uh, top, topographically, if we're still thinking in terms of a landscape analogy? Um, first, you, uh, the basic health might have something to do with infant irritability. Anyone who's been a parent in the, in the room 
understands that irritability of an infant um, is, affects how you interact with it. Uh, uh, parental sleep and um, infant alertness is also going to affect if an infant is immediately looking you in the eye and smiling at you, you're immediately setting up a bonding, um, a bonding <coughs> uh, process, a, bond, a dyadic process that then carries on. Um, and then, and as I say, parent-infant bonding. So these are all things that could be, fall, could be a, a fallouts, important fallouts of some very basic physiological differences at birth uh, without getting into what causes the different size or different rates of development that may go on prenatally. Uh, so uh, if we know that we start out at birth with some categories enhanced for um, genitally boy babies and genitally girl babies, that already is enough for us to begin, have a theory of how different differentiation could begin. So I need to then make a point which, again, I, th I think probably a lot of you in the room already know, but it's often forgotten that uh, early interactive experience, that is the landscape topography, shapes brain development. So we're not talking about an infant with a born fixed brain. We're talking about an infant with um, a brain that has significant structure to it, but it's pretty undifferentiated. And we can see that here. This is a, 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 a drawing of a slice through the cerebral cortex of a neonate showing, um, showing neural cells. And you see that it's pretty sparse. There are not very many connections. These individual neurons are not very bushy or branched. Um, at three months of development, they've developed, they're developing some structure and importantly, interconnectivity. Um, they're growing like, the, uh, growing like crazy, and I'm talking three months postnatally. So this is development that's happening on that landscape outside in the world with many, many inputs. And in response to, that's the other thing about contemporary neuroscience is that it's very clear that the brain, um, that uh, postnatal brain development requires sensory input from the world of all sorts in order for it to happen. Um, and a sensorily deprived infant does not thrive. <laughs> um, so six months, there's even more bushiness and more interconnectivity, and you see this um, very densely connected brain by 15 months of development, uh, just in the, in the same area. The nerve cells themselves have become, uh, become like little trees, and they're all touching each other in different ways and making connections uh, that are part of what, um, of what <coughs> allows the developmental skills that we see a 15-month-old has acquired that a two-day-old does not have. So part of my argument I'm going to make, or part of my model, is that I'm going to say that embodied gender, uh, that is, I'm arguing that gender is part of the body or becomes part of the body, uh, begins as something that um, that I and some psychologists call pre-symbolic coding. And that by this, it's pre-symbolic coding is generated from sensory receptors and encoded in the brain and peripheral nervous system, um, pre-linguistically. So this is a very early, this is the first year of life that we're talking about. And um, I wanna show you a, a little bit about how this could happen and I'm gonna show you this uh, what I'm going to begin to develop the background for how this might be related to gender specific interests. And I'm relying here on the work of um, the absolutely brilliant work of a psychologist named Carol Rovi Collier uh, on infant memory. Um, and what she did was demonstrate that even very young infants, three months old, have a memory, they can remember things. And what she did to demonstrate this was, I'm gonna show you, this is a little video actually, I'll show you, but I wanna set the scene for it, is she, um, she took little babies, tied them on their back, tied a little ribbon around their ankle, and then tied the other end of the ribbon to a mobile. And uh, at first the baby kind of just riddled around, but after a while, the baby began to figure out that if it kicked its leg, it could move the mobile. 
that as it began to realize it had some agency. At first it was moving the mobile by accident, but then it, it realized it had agency. All right, leave the baby alone, come back in three weeks. Does the baby um, take as long as the first time to start kicking with agency? Or does the baby remember and, and much more quickly begin to move that mobile again? The, the answer is yes, it does remember. Um, and it remembers with different kinds of context. So when I show you this video, um, also there's a very funny thing um, on the video where if you, if you look, um, look here at some point, you will see a student who's hiding behind here. <laughs> peek through to see what the baby is doing. But I also want you to note how the, um, the context of the crib is set by this cloth that's wrapped over it, and then in the background for use in a different experiment, um, which I'll talk about, it's a Raggedy Ann doll. So let's just show this clip. Now we can kick just as before for nine minutes. Oh. 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 The next time Jess gets back in that crib, up till three weeks later, um, it will not take her anywhere near as long to, to start moving that mobile around on purpose. So it's these ideas that, um, that I've developed, uh, inspired by Esther Thalen's work on this. Um, and um, I didn't want that to show up at first, but. Um, let me see what happens. Okay, so we start out here with, uh, with this is, think of this as a cross section through a landscape. So instead of that three dimensional drawing, you've taken a slice through it. So we're looking just at one time in the landscape. But you have the mobile and you have a kind of context. The context being that cloth around the, um, around the crib. And that's what uh, Roby Collier calls a familiar context, the test room wall, wallpaper or crib design. And when, you, um, and when that's there, the mobile dominates. That is, the minute the infant sees the, the mobile, gets all excited. Um, so the mobile attractor dominates. Uh, so it's, it's Thalen, Esther Thalen, who, um, who gave the, the attractor language to this, to this work. Um, but there are other kinds of context. There's something called a salient context. Um, that is, what happens if, in addition to that, to that familiar context, you put something like a Raggedy Ann doll in the crib? Um, and the infant is really interested in the Raggedy Ann doll, too. But also, um, uh, but also does the Raggedy Ann doll then, um, then help? Well, let me just show you what happens. Uh, so Raggedy Ann doll in the crib. Um, and that salient context, um, uh, so if, if you do that, the, the infant will also get very excited about the Raggedy Ann doll. Um, and what happens is that the mobile context forms, begins to form an association or associated attractor with the Raggedy Ann doll. So you put the Raggedy Ann doll in, and the infant will also then remember that it can make the mobile move. And what happens with time then is that the associated tra attractors, the mobile and the context at first are separately retrievable, but with time, visual memories of either reactivates memories of both. So the two separate attractors become merged into a single thing. Um, so how could this be relevant to gender? Um, suppose, Suppose that um, the mobile in, in gender world was not a mobile, but was affection, warmth, and excitement for any 
context or situation. And suppose the salient context was gender. So, um, so you have a, a situation in which gender is at play. It's a special doll. It's a, um, it's a combing the hair. It's an anything that becomes part of the gendered world of an, of an infant and a little girl or a little boy. Um, and they start out separate, kind of separate. Or uh, they are in the same place at the same time, often. Um, suppose then they become linked in a way that's inseparable in the same way that memory can link the Raggedy Ann doll and, um, and, the, and the familiar context. So let's look at an example of sex, for sex differences in toy preferences, uh, where you start out with, um, with a preference, say, for a truck or a doll, um, and gender being boy or a girl, and you have exposure over time to the truck and the doll, and you have an increasing um, gender, uh, an increasing gender knowledge and skills, and I'll show you what these are um, in a second. I'll show you each. I'll explain each of these in, in some detail in a second. Um, and what happens eventually, I'm going to argue, is that preference for a particular toy and gender be eventually form a single attractor. That is, they start out as separate, um, as separate inputs but that with time and repeated, um, and repeated reinforcement, essentially, they become, they, they be join into a single attractor. So at time one, uh, zero to 10 months, there are no sex differences in toy preference, and, and this is important to keep in mind, so this is something you don't start out with, but it's something you develop. Um, but at time four, three to four years, three years, there are strong differences in sex differences in toy preferences of the sort that we, um, that I elaborated in the introduction to the talk. So how does the landscape get shaped then? So we have exposure. Um, uh, the landscape topography is shaped by a physical, the physical preference, the presence of of different toys, and interestingly, there are almost no studies on what's in the newborn infant's crib, toy-wise. Mm -hmm. um, again, simple data to collect, an undergraduate could collect that. Basic information is missing. Um, so, uh, but we, I am going to assume that there are different things in the cribs of little boys and little girls at, um, at birth. Uh, the second thing is uh, associated affection and excitement. This is another aspect of just how excited is a parent when a child is playing with a toy or looking at a toy or even trying to attract a child's interest with a toy. As you'll see, um, a, a two or three month old isn't always interested in too much. Um, and then there's infant, <laughs> there's infant originated interest, that is infants Ha do have their own personalities and things that attract them and interest them for whatever reason we don't know, but that's certainly part of the um, uh, part of the uh, story here. And then we have gender knowledge and skills. And first, I'll start at the beginning with the <coughs> physical presence and um, and associated affection and excitement. These are videos that I've been studying, or the, with the help of many, many, many Brown undergraduate students who've done huge amounts of coding, um, but I think they'll, what's going on will be some, and the audios are kind of difficult to hear, and I provide a transcript in the next slide, so these are very short, come back here, there, first this one. You know what's up on your phone? That's a Celtic oh, bib, by the way. Okay, that's one. And this is shows um, uh, affection and excitement in a somewhat older inter child with an interaction with somewhat older child. Oh, yeah, get, get, get. Give a kiss. 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 Give
Oh, very good. The affection. The affection's good, but it has. <laughs> I'm not criticizing the affection. I just want to point out. I just want to point out that um, that when it comes and, and how intense it is is probably pretty important. So just to give you the transcripts in these um, very quickly, on, on the on the little boy don't you want to talk on your phone. Then here's your football. Don't you want to play football? And she repeats that a couple times. You're going to be a football pet player like your daddy was. That's um, that conversation. And this conversation is um, meow, meow, kiss the kitty, <laughs> kiss the kitty. Lot, and there's a lot of kissing sounds. And can, can you give the kitty a kiss? And then in response to the child rolling over, oh, very good, yes. Um, so just these are the kinds of interactions that I already are important in developing pre-symbolic um, accounts of gender in a child's, in a child's uh, nervous system. So what, are, what is gender knowledge? What is developing gender attractor, infant, which I call infant um, skills in gender? Well, <clears throat> by six months of age, a baby can discriminate male voices from female voices. They can habituate to male or female voices. They can, by nine months, they can correlate male and female voices with gender-related objects. The, um, they can discriminate male from female faces, and they can associate female faces and voices. By a year old, they can associate male faces and voices, and I imagine this is a changing, um, this is based on data that comes up through the 90s at the most recent. I'm imagining, I'm imagining that these, these, this knowledge will change as more and more men are involved earlier and earlier in childcare, that this is a familiarity question. Um, but children are developing a knowledge of gender. Infants have, have a developing knowledge of gender. Um, so the topography that is the main events, I'm arguing shapes infant neuromuscular systems and leaves pre-symbolic traces in the memory, and a couple more videos. These kids are the same age. One is a boy, a girl. We'll see first. And again, I'll play you the transcript. I'll give you the transcript. <laughs> All right, and a little boy of the same age. This starts with an episode right before we start coding that is a, a, an episode of um, affection. <gasps> oh, kissing you. Enough kisses, Mom. There's enough kisses, Mom. There's enough. Oh, he's getting so excited. And stand. Let's work out those legs. Let's work out those legs. Come on. Up, up. Good boy. You're getting strong. Look at you. Look at you. You're a tough kid. So, <clears throat> so it sounds like you all could hear those audios, that, and especially the, the praise. You could also see um, and one of the things we wondered, and I had a student study this last year, was whether there were, um, that the mother, although it was uh, uh, assisted standing, the mother of the little girl was holding the child much closer, and the mother of the little boy was holding it out. So we looked to see, we, we coded to see whether that was a consistent difference um, between mothers of boys and mothers of girls, and also we coded all of the language um, that, uh, that went on. And, I'll pass by the transcript. Um, so, and just could touch be an early facilitator of, inter, uh, of intergenerational transmission of gender identity and behaviors. And 
The physical handling, that is the distance, was different between boys and girls, but it wasn't significantly different. And, different. and we have a very small sample size, so um, we have a sample size of 30 kids, 15 boys and 15 girls. So uh, if someone were to redo this study, um, first of all, importantly, on a, on a current population of babies, but also um, on a larger population, which you could do if you didn't code for as many different things um, as we coded for, you could find out whether this was a, a currently a significant thing. But even with the small sample size, the vocalization content was different, was quite different. Um, it differed sin significantly um, in terms of generally, in terms of babbling, encouraging movement, general praise, and praise about body size and strength. Um, all was greater, significantly greater uh, from the mothers of boys than from the mothers of girls. So, uh, <clears throat> and th these are um, these are kids who are three to six months old. So, what about touch? We looked at a lot of different touch, and it is back to these landscape representations. And we uh, and what this shows are uh, the. The, our data from three to four months, five to six months, up to 11 to 12 months. I'm going to give you, again, the mothers of boys, the mothers of girls, and the difference. And where we had significant differences, um, at, we had for um, boys, mothers of boys doing things more than mothers of girls. They lifted the boys up more, and they assisted them to move around more. But the mothers of girls engaged in more caretaking. Um, that is, and by care caretaking we devise as combing the hair, fixing the ribbon, adjusting the clothing. Um, so there was a lot, uh, there was a lot more of that going on at three to four months. Those differences persisted at five to six months. The lift up stopped, and then, um, and then fall off. And the one difference that persists through <coughs> until twelve months is that the boys continue to get more assisted shifts up through 12 months. So they're getting more, um, more help with moving from, um, from, their, uh, from their mothers than the girls are. So the touch landscapes really differ uh, and, and in important combinations. Gradually though, gender becomes symbolic and uh, by symbolic here, I, I think uh, we begin to see that by 18 months, uh, there are metaphoric gender associations, gender-typed visual preference, stereotype knowledge. Um, uh, they can recognize labels associated with faces, um, and and they have they have an, an 18-month-old. If you give them pictures of, um, if you show them pictures of men doing activities and women doing activities, um, they kind of look and look and look. And then if you show and if you show them doing gender appropriate activities. Um, they continue to look, but they, they, stop, or they stop still if you suddenly insert one that's gender inappropriate, a woman using a hammer, a man putting on lipstick. Um, then they kind of go, huh? Um, you can tell that, they've, that even, they're not verbal yet, these kids, but you can tell from studying how they're looking at it that they've seen something unusual, uh, which means they already have acquired some knowledge of standard stereotypes by 18 months, a year and a half. Um, and then it goes on to, uh, by, by closing in on three years, they begin to have nonverbal gender identity, and by three years they can begin to have their own um, self-identity. Um, and of course, the, the, I love this image um, of gender symbolism. Uh, by a, a Korean artist, Jung Mi Yoon, and you can go to her website. It's, it's, she's got, this is just two pictures from it, but they're quite stunning. Um, obviously, this is one idea about gender symbolism, and we hear about it a lot. Oh, my little girl loves pink, it must be important. I, I can't tell you how many times someone comes up to me after that and says that. Oh, one of you may say that to me after, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it is gender symbolism, that's all I want to say. Um, so let's tie things together here. We have infants develop, um, de first of all, the argument is infants develop and learn by sensory input. 
Um, the brain, co brain connectivity proliferates starting even before birth. Infants experience gender from before birth, um, and I can explain that more in question, in question and answers if, if you'd like me to. Um, that is birth, there's nothing magic about birth being the starting point. Um, gender information is entering through the walls of the uterus before birth. Um, and via the minutia of everyday care. Um, but they also bring their own individually differentiated physiological systems to the table. Infants develop gender recognition skills during the first year, which are coded pre-symbolically in the sensory and motor systems. And infants develop gender performance skills and preferences during the second year. Um, and, and with language, these consolidate um, during years two and three into internal identity attached to embodied um, and external gendered symbols, toys, activities, peer preferences, those kinds of things. So just to tie it back to a kind of landscape version, we have pre-symbolic gender formation and representation um, uh, le uh, leading to um, uh, mediated by language, leading to um, so phase one to phase two, which is a transition to symbolic formation and representation. And you can look at this this way with a, using a landscape representation where you have four different infants represented up here, um, and you have these different troughs. And here I've added in here, so think of these as weights that are swinging from the landscape and shaping it in different ways. Um, so you have uh, the weights now, I've, I've, given, I've added some, some labels to these weights, parental touch and affection, dyad formation and attachment, clothes, toys, and other physical inputs, <coughs> infant physiology and temperament, adult gender, faces, voices, um, dress, et cetera. These are all some of the weights which shape the landscape, and so they aren't only external to the infant, they include the infant, is also shaping the landscape, but these are all things that are happening um, as, uh, as these different infants roll down, um, roll down this, navigate this landscape and end up either bifurcating in this direction and then here and here or here and here and you can add in uh, a much wider spectrum of bifurcations. Uh, but in this, in this image you begin, <coughs> this allows you to see the landscape itself being shaped by these weights hanging from it. So in phase three, 18 to 36 months, you have, um, you have a forming gender identity attractor that has symbolic representation, independent, that is the child, independent to the child, independent subjectivity, and internalization. Um, and these are all the things that, um, that parents then confront by a child age three who has his, own, his or her own opinions about whether he's a boy or she's a girl. Um, and, um, and what kind of clothes they want to wear and who they want to play with and what kind of toys they want to play with. Um, that's becoming pretty evident by age three with a lot of um, slop in the actual timetable. Uh, but that, um, that's sort of where, where it brings you to. And what you have here then is you have, it, you have a spectrum of internalized gender identity and behavior expressions um, at, with, uh, with that one side, the extreme side, which might be, um, with, uh, you have Barbie and at the other extreme sides you have G.I. Joe. And what you really have is almost everything in between in all sorts of different combinations. Um, occasionally you have someone who likes Barbie and G.I. Joe, that's probably pretty rare, um, but, but I'm sure it happens. Um, and you have all of these different combinations the linear, the linear setup, obviously I stole this from, um, from the internet. Uh, the linear setup isn't, isn't right, but it's a, enough to tell us that we're looking at um, a huge amount of gender variability in children um, with regard to both internalized gender identity and the, the behavioral expressions that get attached to that internalized gender. Um, so that's kind of the model I'm working with at the moment. And I, I think it takes us a long way from, uh, from oh, it's 20% nature and 80% nurture or whatever, 
Uh, and I think that, and I, for me, it's a much more satisfying way of thinking about things. And I think it ultimately works much better with the kind of data that you saw um, uh, in the first part, in the first session this morning. Um, and if you think that this processual um, nature of gender and if you add in sexuality uh, continues throughout the life cycle, that it is, doesn't stop at age three. Uh, I've stopped at age three, but, um, but it obviously continues on throughout that. So just to close, as we're thinking about this, I'll put these on for you. That's my favorite. <laughs> okay. Dr. Falco Sterling is willing to answer questions if we have questions in the audience.